identifying the innovation opportunities. I want to take a very concrete example to share with you. And it's the example of the High Five, which is a co-working space where Wau Lab, my company, is based. And the first thing you might think is, well, High Five is closed, right? So is there nothing to do for them, for their customers during this time? That might be your first thought, but I want to really challenge that um, today. And so to think how actually, uh, how can businesses, even the ones that are struggling, keep on adapting? Olivia, I've just launched, by the way, the yeah. survey. I think we just yeah. jumped to slide 10. So maybe as a quick, uh, yeah. as a quick uh, note, um, there is a poll that I just launched. Um, very quick, very simple, but maybe you can do that on the way and I think we'll come back to that. Yeah, exactly. So I'm checking, yeah. Exactly, perfect for the poll. I'll, I'll come to it in a moment. Um, this is actually, probably most of you are familiar with design thinking, which is an approach to innovation. And it's an approach to innovation. Design thinking is really a philosophy to say, to, to innovation that is human-centered. So it's really based on empathy with your customers, but also collaboration. And even now, if you think about businesses, that are struggling with the current crisis, probably the solution is not gonna come just from marketing or just from sales or IT. It's everyone together with their own insights that will and can contribute to a solution. And thirdly, design thinking is really based on fast experimentation. It means you have an idea, you make it tangible and you test it. And that's a way to, to both go fast and also ensure your chances of success without spending too long in the development phase. And so indeed, that's the first poll. I'm really curious to see from you guys today, would, who of you um, is actually applying design thinking to your organization and also yeah, to your marketing? But you, you can answer the question in the broader sense. And I'm checking at the results, I see, oh, okay, I see 30, 26 people voted, um, which is quite good. Uh, okay, a quarter says yes, 50% no, and 27 kind of, okay. Interesting, maybe you'll get some, some insights today into, into how you can further apply this. I want to, yeah, I think I'm going to end this first poll. And probably you, if I share results, then you can also see the results. Here we go. Okay. Perfect. I'm struggling a bit. If I should just close this. Yeah. All right, so design thinking, to come back to it, there are five steps with design thinking. The first step is really empathize with your audience. How are they feeling? What is their pains? What do they need right now? Once you have a clear view on that, you can define a problem that you are trying to solve. What is, and that is also very specific to design thinking before, people were just thinking about what is the right answer to this question. And with design thinking, the idea is what is the right question to ask? So it's, it's a bit different. Once we have this, this question, then we can generate ideas. Okay, how can we solve this problem? We have identified our audience is experiencing. Prototyping the full step means being able to quickly visualize the ideas in order to test them. And today, in this webinar, we're going to apply these five steps to the case that we have chosen, which is that of High Five, a co-working space. And I want to check, I think it's clear for, for most people, but the, the idea of High Five as a co-working space is that you have both uh, private offices for maybe 5, 10, 20 people, as well as freelancers or people who don't have a fixed desk. And everyone shares the common spaces, while some have separate offices. 
So the first yeah, thing, well, Olivia, quick question before we move on. We have the other poll. Should we launch it actually? Um, I think the next poll. Um, no, it's a bit. It's a, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, it perfect. Exactly match <laughs> because it it doesn't exactly match the, the slides, but I will I will let you know. So, understanding your, your audience. I want to share with you uh, two tools that we use and that I think can be super useful for you and for your business. This is the first one. It's called the empathy map. So first of all, how are your customers feeling? And that comes back to what I was mentioning, right? If these are very challenging times for your customers. Maybe they're afraid, maybe, maybe they feel insecure. What are the main points? What are, are they experiencing right now? What is their overall goal? And then also what influences them and what are the tasks that they are trying to complete. So again, if we quickly apply this to a co-working space, um, we'll come back to it, but the co-workers may, may be feeling, um, again, insecure or about the business. And also if you think there are a lot of maybe like people here attending freelancers that might be insecure about their revenues, their businesses, um, etc. So this really gives you an ID. I'm not going to go too deep because we'll come back to it later. But doing this exercise really helps when it comes to generating IDs and also identifying the right problem to solve. This is another method for, for gathering insights. So if you want to know how your audience, your customers are feeling, you can ask them through interviews. And then probably people will, will say what they say or think, right? But if you want to go deeper, you can actually observe how do they behave. And sometimes this doesn't entirely match. A famous example is when you ask people about recycling, uh, a lot of them say, oh, it's super important for me. Yeah, oh, of course I do it. And then when you observe, um, you, you might notice that actually a lot of the people who said they were really keen on recycling, are not actually recycling. And then it helps to understand what drives them. What are their feelings? What is their, their motives to act in such a way? And if you get that level of understanding in the solutions you develop, you can also have a bigger impact. So those are two concrete tools. And now is the time to launch the poll. <laughs> David, um, if we look at these two tools, who of you, um, that would be the second poll. Yep, I already launched I think it. I, maybe I need to end the, yeah, okay, perfect. Um, uh, no, you, I think you just stopped it. Uh, let me restart it. Oh, sorry. You, yeah, it's okay. Ah, uh, no, you're right. Um, no worries. To the next one. So the, the second poll is to see who of you has, who of you have done really this empathy exercise to know how are my customers feeling? What are they experiencing? What is their main point, things? And the reason I mentioned that also is because a lot of companies, their first focus is survival. So they'll say, okay, I have taken measures for my employees. I know how my employees I fe are feeling and I have done a lot of internal initiatives but then some of them might have forgotten in the cost cutting and the ar arranging your internal organization to actually really check that with the customers i have already 20 people who voted i'll leave a bit more time it looks quite clear this time huh that's yeah. a strong trend Yeah, I think I can, I will share the results with you, so I will end this now. But it's really interesting basically to see that share results, here we go. That actually only one person, <laughs> congratulations, um, mentions really having done this exercise. Um, and there is a big 76% uh, that we say no. Um, so here is already a quick win from after the webinar, uh, if, if you all get the tool to, to try to do this exercise together.
Okay. Thank you for participating. So now let's let's define the problem we want to solve. That's the second step in design thinking. And here I want to introduce the notion of job to be done. I don't know again, maybe in the chat uh, quickly, how many people are familiar with the notion of job to be done. I'm, I'm curious to see um, if you wanna share. So the notion of job to be done, it's actually written, what jobs are your customers trying to get done? So I'll give you an example for Walt Disney, the, the theme park, the job to be done. And, and that's what makes Disney different from Walibi or, or Eftelings or other theme parks is actually to create um, memories with the family. You probably, when you go to someone's house and they have kids, it's likely that they might have a picture with Mickey or Minnie Mouse. And, um, and that's really the job to be done of this of Disney. They're not just trying to distract you. They, they really have this concept of creating memories. And I want to ask you, what do you think, and you can answer in the chat, is the job to be done for a co-working space? So again, I'll leave you just a few. Um, I'll leave you just a few moments to see. Yeah, renting and networking. Thank you, Aurore. I don't know if there are other uh, people focus on work and connect with others. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah, provide workspace and social structures. Yeah, thank you, Alexandra, Valeska. Collaborate efficiently. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for your contribution. So here it's interesting, if I come back to the, the whole in infrastructure uh, and workspace, it's part of it, but that's not the main reason. Because if you think about it, a lot of people actually have a desk at home, right? So if it was just about having a desk and a Wi-Fi connection, probably a lot of people can work from home. So here the idea is really facilitating co-workers job. And that comes back to what um, Mario was saying, you know, let people focus on work by, by facilitating something like our work co-working space is really offering um, uh, like admin or other services to, to make your life easy, easier. Um, but also business opportunities. A lot of people go to a co-working space because they want to find potential customers and of course, social contacts. So now that we have our job to be done and our empathy map, we can really go into defining this, phrasing this as a question. And here we decided to say, okay, how might we facilitate co-workers' jobs while, while providing them with business and social opportunities, all of this within the COVID-19 environment, meaning no physical space open. And here I'm going to ask you again, because the third phase is to generate ideas. Do you have some ideas to solve these questions? Well, what would you suggest? Again, I'll leave just a few, few minutes to see if some, some of you, maybe Aurore, Valeska, Alexandra, are inspired. Yeah, interesting, weekly hangout on Jets. Coffee break and exchange ideas. Okay, so having a virtual space to connect, basically. Having events. Mm -hmm. Creating a WhatsApp group. Yeah. Yeah, create a network virtual. Mm -hmm. Very cool.
doing the sessions. Mm -hmm. Slack. Slack is a really good tool as well. We, we had not yet implemented it for Wow Lab, and now we have, and it's, it's actually really a good, a good win for us. So let's see if we have one more input, exchange best practices. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for, for the contribution. So now let's have a look at some of the things you, you mentioned, right? Having a virtual space uh, like Slack, but also uh, social exchanges, right? So it could also be an idea to say, to keep providing coworkers with business opportunities to really create a platform to exchange services and here to really play on this solidarity vibe. Social activities online, again, our co-working space as well is offering yoga or after work or karaoke or like the donuts or coffee break that you mentioned, you mentioned. Free access to a video conferencing uh, space, uh, creating this access to a virtual space, this could also be an idea but also pick up and scan the physical mail that people no longer have access to. Uh, but also webinar, again, exchanging best practices on homeworking, productivity or others. So you see the, the first reaction might be, oh, okay, but the co-working space is closed. So that's it, right? Not entirely. And now what's interesting and that's, yeah, informing about financial help. That's also another idea, right? If you want to help people focus on work, to offer them to do all the admin steps and approaches to really identify what are the helps they can get and helping them get, get it. So now four and fifth, as I mentioned, is really prototyping, so visualizing and testing. And here, um, that's again an example for if you want to know before you set up a whole team to pick up and scan people's physical mail, it might be worth to check, are people interested in that service? So that's also a concrete example of just launching a survey and you say, hey, how are you doing? What are your needs? You can really ask your customers, how are you feeling? What is your biggest challenge right now? And also to, to then ask them, are you interested in that service? And if they answer yes, uh, then you can set up a team and arrange it. And again, that's a quick win in terms of times to, to just validate the idea before you invest too much energy, money, time into it. And there are other ways uh, to really test ideas. A first way is to pretend it's real. So you could create just a landing page, um, for instance, to see, is there an interest for that service? Right, so I want, that's a good example is Malt Academy, for instance, that's really a, a nice adaptation. And maybe before Malt Academy launched 50 webinars, they launched one and they saw, okay, how much interest do we get? And if you validate, then you go full in. Other things you can do with your customers are discussions. So you could invite two or three of your customers to a discussion uh, and you ask them a few questions and then it's really interesting how they interact with each other because they can explain their point of views and maybe they have different points of view and you just stand there and you listen and your customers will also greatly appreciate you for doing this initiative because they will really see that you care. And sometimes again, in this period of uncertainty, feeling worthy, considered, listened to, is <laughs> quite big for people. Okay, and among the different ways of testing, there is also usability testing. If you have a more developed concept, um, then you can also really develop a flow online and see if it works. And of course, there are also always the possibility to do one-to-one -one interviews um, with people. It can be a quick five, 10 minutes call um, to really identify again. Or just success them, hey, I'm calling you five minutes because we are launching this initiative. I wanted to have your opinion on it. Would you be interested? Yes, no, why? Um, and the good news is that when it comes to qualitative interviews, you just need a sample of five to six people to validate your proposition. So it's not as with the quantitative when, where you need like 30 or 40 or more. So it can be really quick and you can do it several times. 
Okay, so that's mostly what I wanted to share when it comes to um, understanding the context, identifying the opportunities, and also some quick steps into making it happen. Um, now it's up to you. So I think as, as well that I, David, I, <laughs> before I go here, we can actually launch the, the third and last poll, which is who of you um, have actually launched new customer initiatives. And I insist on the customer part because I'm sure you probably have launched initiatives internally. It's really about customer facing as well. All right. 60% has voted. And give you just a bit more time. Well, I think that's always there's a connection, right? Um, if you take away freedom and you're confined to a certain extent, yeah, you always have to become creative to make it work. And uh, that's I'm really convinced that you know situations like these they they really bring up new in innovation. Mm -hmm. And many of the things I think that are being invented these days they they're probably there to stay. Yeah, uh, we for one, I mean. We really see it works with that, with the multi academy. The interest is super high, and pretty sure we're going to keep it after afterwards. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Thank you, David. I think also often organizations they lack the trigger to change because change is always uncomfortable, right? And so sometimes they're like, mm, "We might be do this," but now this situation really confronts them that they don't have a choice any longer. <laughs> You see that very much with retail who now move towards online and actually yeah. try to sell online something they wouldn't have done before. So, Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a bit similar for us because we are very much busy with marketing strategy and digital marketing. And so a lot of companies now are like, hmm, yes, we need to do more <laughs> with our online presence. And so they, they take action. Okay, I will end the poll and share the results. So we have 10 uh, respondents, so 40%. Uh, congratulations, who have uh, launched initiatives, 60% who haven't. Um, so thank you for sharing. And now the, the last poll uh, is actually from the ones who have launched initiatives, have you achieved the desired results? So again, just waiting. Launching number number four. Yeah, perfect. So that's really interesting, right? First of all, okay, you take an initiative and then to 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 do check. Well, has that worked? Okay, and again, just waiting. Just a bit longer, so people have the chance to answer. Okay, thanks. I'm also reading on, on the chat. All right, I think I can share the results of the poll with you. Okay, so interesting. 40% on success rate in the, in the sense of achieving desired results. And again, you know, when it comes to design thinking, what's, what matters is to really have these ideas and test them. And you learn either way, if it works, that's a great learning that this is a good match. And if not, this really puts you on the right track to say, okay, what do I need to slightly change or adjust for this idea to really work? Okay, so, Again, back to the slides, uh, as I was saying, now it's up to you. So some quick things from, from um, some actions to take, as mentioned, to maybe realize an empathy map for your customers. And uh, we will send, send to you the presentation, the slides, as well as the map, really in a separate document for, for you to, to use. Define your challenge. 
And um, a question I had as well during another webinar was really interesting. Does your challenge have has to be 100% about your job to be done? Not necessarily. It can also be about an opportunity that really matches your, your vision and your identity as a company. Then it also makes sense, especially if it answers one of your customers' real challenges. And then thirdly, yeah, generating ideas and quickly testing them, validating them with your audience. And uh, we have also developed a scan, how future proof um, is your business. And that can really be helpful to check in this period, uh, a, a bit of a, a checklist of have you taken the right actions to also prepare the, the after COVID-19. And uh, yeah, finally, I want to share with you that also when it comes to customer experience, right? We saw in the beginning what makes people unhappy. And when it comes to what makes people happy, is about connection, progress, um, certainty, and consideration. And there are really easy ways to, to give that to your customers. So again, even if you don't have right now the most innovative ID, you can make a big difference to your customers in these challenging times for them, simply by being there for them, listening, showing them you care, showing them some opportunities, to grow, to learn, like again, Mal's Academy is a good example of that, of playing on this development side, um, making people feel worthy and, you know, considered listened to. So, so again, I'm sure there are many actions for you to, to take. Um, and again, I want to say these are very <laughs> challenging times. Don't get me wrong. Um, but by being there for your customers, and showing them you care genuinely, you could make their days just a little bit better. And that could all actually be quite beneficial on the very short term, but also on the long run. So thank you. Um, now place for Q and A's. And again, uh, thanks very much for, for attending and um, I look forward to exchanging with you. Yeah, so please feel free to use the chat if you have questions. Um, indeed, I think, you know, that making aware that it's not only the eye, the intellect, it's also the, the emotional quotient in a way, you know, listening to your customers, building trust. I think that's exactly the time for that now. Yeah. I think a uh, very, very relevant recommendation uh, for everybody who's talking to their customers. Any questions, please feel free to ask. I think we have the time, we're well in time. Lots of thank yous. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and again, I want to encourage you, even if Sometimes when it's hard to define the right question or to find answers, so really start with the empathy. Just, you know, even calling one or two customers and really understanding how it's for them. And then probably it comes naturally, um, what is their biggest challenge and then how you can really help them with this. Um, Rufin, um, you said that you were late. Let me quickly answer that. Um, so this webinar has been recorded, it will be made available. Um, and I think Olivier, you said that selected slides, especially the empathy map, um, also you can, you can send them out afterwards. So very happy to share. Yeah. And I want to answer Mario, who writes, uh, we did a survey um, how we can, could help our clients with our knowledge, but the response rate was worse than normal. Mario, it could just be that a newsletter um, is not the best way to check in with your customers. So then, as I mentioned, you could try um, emailing, but just, you know, not like a formal email in a template, but selecting five customers and sending them even a WhatsApp, I don't know what identity is your business, or, or calling them and really saying, hey, um, I just want to check in with you. How are you doing? Uh, is there anything I can do? And that could be um, a good insight. 
or, or even posting on, on social media. Mario, if you have um, an active Facebook page and you have like, I don't know, 2000 followers and people are really interacting, you could also just uh, post a poll there and say, hey guys, we want to be there for you and asking an open question and inviting a discussion there as well. Again, you will say, mm, maybe it's a bit tricky if it's about uh, like you're producing a product that's not delivered. You don't want very angry <laughs> answers, but just generating some, some ideas and you pick the one that is most appropriate to your business. <laughs> yeah. No worries, Mario. Well, Sebastian's asking a question for us. Um, well, um, what we see did increase is that, um, um, well, we actually did grow uh, in, the, in the last month still. Um, so yes, but it mean, I think if, if the lockdown continues forever, I think it will be a challenging time for everybody. Um, but, I, you know, as a company, I think we're quite in solid state um, and well, um, obviously there also to help you or freelancers because you're, you're, you're customers as well. But the same goes for, for the companies that indeed, I think you, Olivia said it very well, should also think about the after and they should also not forget to innovate and try new things. But if they, you know, completely stop now everything, um, they will probably be in a worse state than they were before. So that thought we're really pushing with them to, you know, challenge themselves what are the things they can you know start to do that to help them come out of the of the crisis or the situation more in a big curve and you know much better than they were before um, and 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 i think also the idea of you know talking and listening to your customers understanding their needs is is even more important right um you know than the pure matchmaking the mechanical part of selling um being there for them being a, a counterpart a listening I think so, um, and that's something, of course, we can do at all times, um, and probably even more so in these days. Yeah, and I want to add to that two things. The first one, you could also ask customers about their needs when we go out of the lockdown, to say, hey, we really want to be there for you. There is not much we can do right now, but in a week, two weeks, three weeks, there will be. So what is your priority, and how can we be there for you then? That can also be useful. And the second thing, um, you saw that I mentioned marketing a few times in my presentation. Um, it's because at the moment, since again, there is n not anymore this face-to-face -face interaction. Think about your salespeople. If you have a great sales, Kevin is amazing, but it's very good at face-to-face -face meetings and now he's not meeting with anyone. Then you do need marketing to, to keep um, showing your company to the outside world because now it's the only channel, right? And that is also why this shift or why, in my opinion, marketing has, has an important role to play in keeping the dialogue and the discussion with the customers and with the outside world. And I see a question from Shore, MS, I'm not sure I pronounce. Um, sure, I can, uh, I'm happy to maybe, um, maybe I can just share share the screen again for that, if that helps. Um, so here we are back to the empathy map. Or oh, let me, yeah, here we go. So the concept of the empathy map, and I have a, a nice story actually I, about that. The, I, I was meeting with an entrepreneur friend um, at a restaurant and I really drew the empathy map on a napkin saying, hey, this is a very cool tool to be listening to your customers. And then a week later, when I visited his office, he had printed this in eight free formats for all of his employees, because most of his employees were really on the phone with customers. So the goal of the empathy map is to really immerse yourself in the world of your customer. So if I take the example of, of my friend, right? Um, the people who, if you have your customer on the phone, what are the tasks they are trying to complete? What questions do they need to, to answer? It's really to, to have an answer to that. So 
I'm thinking of a concrete example. Um, co-working is good. Maybe it's a bit too too narrow. I'll take my example with, with my. Uh, as I mentioned, I have ordered new windows that I'm waiting for. So what are the tasks I'm trying to complete or the questions I need answered is when will my windows be delivered? It's okay if they, they have a delay, but is it one week, two weeks? Um, what is the impact? Uh, and the task I'm also trying to complete then is to know what is the impact that the lead delivery of my windows has on my overall renovation project? How am I feeling? I might be feeling very frustrated because I, I did the right steps on time and because, or I might be feeling, um, how do you say, in French it's uh, impuissant or feeling like I can't do anything because it's out of my reach. What is influencing me? Um, it might be other delays in my renovation or other things, decisions that I need to take that, that changes the game. Uh, and again, what is my overall goal? Well, in this case, it's pretty straightforward. I want my windows delivered on time or ASAP. And what are my pains? Uh, uncertainty or extra, um, extra renovation project lengths or extra cost or low availability of, of um, if I haven't picked my windows yet, it could be low availability of showrooms to really see the products. And then my goal might be, I want to see a virtual example of that to make my mind. So that's a bit about the tool. The idea is don't think about it too much, shoot what comes to mind. And it also helps to complete the empathy map to have a complete persona in mind. So a persona is a visual, or is a semi-fictional uh, representation of your audience. So here your persona might be Henry, who is uh, 35 and father of two kids, and he has a job in the bank and he's renovating his house um, and doing the empathy map for this segment or for this persona, if you have one. Yeah, does that answer your question? And I want to react as well to Paul, because I saw you wrote doing co-working during the crisis. Um, I want to mention in my example, the high five is closed. And so my example was what can a closed co-working space do? And <clears throat> I think I've, I've just been on the phone actually yesterday with another co-working space. Yeah. Um, and they're asking themselves exactly that question. For them, it's very, very hard in a way uh, to think about what are the ways they can add value. Um, and I think uh, they're trying to become, or really becoming very, very innovative. They, for example, asked us whether they can sign up all of the freelancers on Malt and have a dedicated page for the co-working. So we were talking about business opportunities to bring together freelancers and their customers. Yeah. So basically both together you know, can work in solidarity and get through the situation. So, you know, I think it's a very good example because they're very much affected yeah. and they, they really want to do something for the community. Yeah, and if you think about it, it could also represent a threat for a co-working space because if most of the clients realize they can work really well virtually and they can find business opportunities and social contacts virtually, then they might, be, they might have to really think, how can we keep on adding value? Or maybe it's a tendency that, and you probably know that there are, like if I look at Brussels, there are so many co-working spaces opening, it's really booming. But maybe in 10 years, there will be a lot of virtual co-working spaces and a lot less physical ones. So this is really also this, this long, long, longer term vision of yeah, what can we learn and, and what, are these, what is the impact on the people and the business? And I see the questions, Paul, after the lockdown, will it be safe <laughs> to work in a co-working space? I think that's a question for the minister. Um, I don't have the answer to that. Um, 
probably not completely. Um, and question from Mario, are tools like Zoom sufficient for your work or what do you miss working with your customers remotely? Hmm. Thank you, Mario, it's a good question. For, for me personally, for Wow Lab, it's quite challenging because since we are also active in innovation and we do a lot of brainstorming, we really like to have that energy where everyone is present in the room and we just have a huge board with post-its and we really have this, yeah, this energy. Um, so I think it is challenging. It's the same for me as a coach. Um, I, I do some coachings uh, about marketing, but also personal coaching via Skype. And, you know, if you see the other person having a lot of emotions or having a challenging time, well, it's, it's harder, right? You can be there, you can look at them and listen, but you, you're not there like a physical presence. So I would say it's not perfect, but it does, it does work. Um, quite well as long as you can have the, the, the video and then in the video really keep the eye contact and keep the, the attention and make breaks often enough that people can also rest and stay focused. 